it's a pleasure for me to return to MSA. And I say that because uh, when this institution was first formed, uh, they had what's known, I think you still have a review committee or a committee that comes in and chooses the students. And I was one of the people that was <coughs> asked to do this for a few years. It's a grueling, <coughs> grueling experience. <laughs> <laughs> they bring food to you. Uh, you're not allowed to go anywhere. I mean, you sit, I forgot which room it was in, but it was unbelievable. Not no, so much just because of the work, but because of the choices that we had to make with regard to all of the great students we had in Illinois. So you should be very, very, very proud to be a part of this institution because I understand from firsthand experience how difficult it is to actually choose you as students and of course all of the faculty here as well and I'm glad that you're here. What I want to do today and what I've been asked to do uh, as part of the History Makers uh, program, when I became a History Maker I hadn't really thought of it uh, as being anything that I actually had done that would get me to a point where someone would want to sit down and interview me for five and a half hours, and it was five and a half hours, <laughs> um, and look at my life. I had been so focused on science. Uh, that's what really drove me from the time I was born. I, I was told by my mother, because I always tore up all of my Christmas gifts to see how they were. Uh, not my sister's, but just mine. And that was basically an indication, at least on the part of my family, that this is in fact what this young person is going to be doing. Um, I have to give them a great deal of credit for not assuming that I was a juvenile delinquent for being that curious. And uh, I, I had a few experiments in my mother's kitchen that helped me to learn how to clean up kitchens. <laughs> What I want to talk to you about today, of course, is this journey. Uh, the History Makers is a organization that actually tries to identify a number of individuals. There are certainly many more than the 5,000 they set, set out to look at in various aspects of our, our world, but certainly of the, of the country that we're in because of all the opportunities and contributions that many people have made. But to give you an idea of what my life was when I grew up in Tuskegee, Alabama in the 1950s, I'm going to go back and tell you a little bit about things that really had nothing to do with science, per se. Um, the reason I'm doing this is because usually I give talks about quarks and gluons and jets and accelerators, and I really like doing that. Uh, this one is a little bit more difficult uh, because there are things that were very emotional things that were very difficult for us in those days. And basically, I'm going to talk about education being the key. A few people who went before me, my path to where I've been, and a little bit about discovery. You always got to put some science in it after all. In the early days of my youth, I began to think about what the universe is made of. And I actually did think about it in that broad a sense and the smallest things that you can study. Now, you have to understand the community that I grew up in. This is Tuskegee, Alabama. It's a very famous city in a lot of ways. You've probably heard of the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, you've heard of Booker T. Washington and all of these folks. Uh, these were standard bearers after the Civil War and after slavery. And what they put together in that particular town is absolutely amazing. One of my personal heroes was George Washington Carver. And I'm going to have a couple of quotes from him because they really did have a great deal to do with the way in which I started to think in my community. Education is the key to unlock the golden door of freedom. Now, you're talking about a guy who was a slave, so freedom really meant that. Since new developments are the products of creative mind, we must therefore stimulate and encourage that type of mind in every way possible. Where there is no vision, there is no hope. Now, you understand that in my community, it really was a lot about the mind. It wasn't about iPads and, and cars, even though there, the most, there are a number of people there who are professionals and they had their own airplanes and that sort of thing. I grew up around that without the thought that what you actually were trying to get and do in your life had something to do with what was inside of you. George Washington Carver, of course, 
was one of the greatest scientists that has uh, ever lived. And as an agricultural chemist, he discovered hundreds of uses for peanuts and pecans and sweet potatoes. Now, I put this slide up, and I know sometimes I've given talks, and people will say, well, we don't want to hear about good old George, because that's what we always heard about. But there are some stories that are usually not told about George Washington Carver, and they were very, very real to me. I'll give you one example. When he finished Hampton University, and he was at Hampton University doing work uh, after getting his degrees in Iowa, the Midwest, he was called by Booker T. Washington and asked to come to Tuskegee to teach. And uh, after a short conversation, he told him that, well, he didn't really have, he couldn't pay him a salary because, you know, they were trying to start the school up and they didn't have much money. So he'd have to, it, also he didn't have a classroom, he didn't have a laboratory. Um, you have some very eager students and that's about it. Now, consider 2013 if someone made you that offer. You know, would you take it? Well, Carver did and he went to that school and his first laboratory was to go to the city dump and get everything that was discarded that he could put in a lab. And he built up his laboratory based upon just that. Now, when I go to Washington and I make these comments to people in the, in the Congress, or at least to people of my, uh, my, uh, my organizations, I tell them, I said, well, we do go and we work very hard to try to get as many dollars as we can to do our very complicated experiments. I said, but I always have in the back of my head what George Washington Carver did. He had nothing. He had no salary. He had a place to stay. And he started his prayer meetings every Thursday night. And that was it. And yet, he created hundreds of products from just things that were in the ground. Now, that's genius. I really got an understanding of what that meant. So I never complained about not having the equipment and materials that I needed to do my experiments. So at Fermilab, I just sort of scrounged and found what I needed to be able to do the experiments. It's, it's a little bit better than that. <laughs> to give you an idea of how incredible this man was, Henry Ford every year came to Tuskegee to try to steal him away. And he offered him a laboratory in Dearborn, Michigan where he would have absolutely everything he wanted. Something like four or $500,000 laboratory. Now translate this from 1943 or 44 or, whatever, or 42 to now. That's billions, not millions. Because he knew that this guy, without too much, could just create things. But let, let's go a little bit further than when Dr. Carver was there. This gives you the basis of how I thought of being a scientist. And I still have that same basis. But in my hometown, what was going on at the time was civil rights. Now this is almost a history lecture, but not much of one. I'm only gonna talk for a few minutes and I'm gonna entertain your questions. The United States Supreme Court had to act on a lawsuit by Charles G. Gormillion and the mayor of Tuskegee, Alabama, Philip Lightfoot. The Alabama Act of, one, of 140 in 1957 was designed essentially to isolate African Americans for the most part from being able to vote. Now, you might say, okay, that's a general sort of thing, but this actually had a direct effect on my personal life because the square that used to be in our city was changed to a multi-polygonal 28 side thing and, ex and ex excluded nearly every African American in Tuskegee except one street and I'll tell I'm going to show you a picture of why that street couldn't be actually excluded and that is the boundary. Now, this is the great thing. So I just I hunted for this picture for a number of weeks because I had to figure out where our house was. So here you see essentially the boundary, and this is about. I'll get to the point. 
This is the boundary that they actually put in, and particularly Tuskegee Institute, which is this area here. This is where the Tuskegee Institute College was. A number of PhDs, doctors, some of the highest academic people in, these, in this area. And if you lived inside of this area here, you could vote. This is 1957, so this is prior to the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act. My house, where I grew up, <coughs> uh, I have to take a step back, was right, <coughs> that dot right there. Now, the reason they couldn't actually move the, the house, the line this way, is because the mayor of the city lived in this area. <laughs> so this street, the street here, called Lastly Street, all the way to the lake, was the only street on which African Americans lived. And actually on the other side of the street, they were outside of the city limits, and on this side of the street, they were. And those are the only people who are allowed to vote. Now, of course, to keep us from voting, there was this thing which we now call terrorism, uh, and people would go and shoot in houses to make sure that you didn't vote and that you didn't integrate the school, the Tuskegee High School, which was also on Lastly Street, uh, right, oh, wait a minute, right there. This particular civil rights Supreme Court decision struck down that which is now called gerrymandering. We use gerrymandering now anyway to maximize the potential political power of particular political groups. But when it started out, that's what it was. It was the ability to essentially disenfranchise people from being able to vote. Well, unfortunately, Besides the terrorism, there was a real struggle that had to happen. And this particular Supreme Court decision led to the Equal Protection Clause of the 15th Amendment, Amendment and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now, I didn't think about this in terms of my life for many, many years until people asked. And I said, oh, yeah, we lived in the city. And when you look at that, at that, at that map, you actually see where we actually live. Also at this time, the integration of that school, which I just told you about, was approximately 400 yards from my front door. But it was a segregated school. I grew up in a segregated society. Now understand something about segregation, how bad it is, not just for African Americans, it was bad for, for for Caucasian Americans as well. Remember I told you about the Tuskegee Institute? The Tuskegee Institute High School, where I went to high school, and this is a hard argument, because usually when I talk about this, I sort of think, well, we know that segregation was wrong. But there was a certain advantage, because the people who actually taught me in high school had graduate degrees. The people who taught our Caucasian students did not. So here you have a system that isolates the students because of color. And we say that's wrong. But at the same time, those people who had graduate degrees could not get a job doing anything else but teaching high school. I benefited from that. Sometimes I wake up at night, sorry about it, but it was a tremendous benefit. I'm not standing here today because I had a bad education. I had an outstanding education. I could go to the college classes when I was a junior in high school, wouldn't be quite as good as Emsa, but nonetheless, I would go in and they would just say, oh yeah, that's that college kid, that high school kid, and just, you know, just stay out of my way. But I learned, and I had access, and that's what education was all about, and I think that's what George Washington Carver was talking about. I have to also mention many of the other things that happened in my uh, hometown. Sammy Young, Jr. was a... Uh, Navy veteran. His brother was in my class and he was murdered. Um, 
in January of 1966. And there's a book written about him, the first student, black student murdered in the Civil Rights Movement. The electionist Lucius Amerson, who was a member of our church, as the first African-American sheriff in the South since Reconstruction, that was 1967. The Tuskegee syphilis experiment conducted between 1932 and 1972 by the United States Public Health Service. And that led to the Office of Human Resource Research Protection. Now, understand something. Each one of these things, the integration of the schools, our education, the murder of Sammy Young, and then the equal protection by, by essentially getting a new sheriff who happened to be African American. Each one of these events led to a community-wide focus on trying to improve our community. So if you're not getting protection from the police, you take over the police. If you don't have a good education, you take that over. The Tuskegee syphilis experiment is a little bit different because this has gone on for a long time and we just didn't know about it. My motivation as a scientist is also intensified by that particular experiment, the experiment on human beings. And when I decided to be a scientist, I never forgot this. Because as a moral person, you have to think about what you're doing. Not just the fact that you do it, but it has a value. As Mr. Carl would say, when you do the common things in life in an uncommon way, you will command the attention of the world. Now you heard that basically in that video, didn't you? Well, Carver did this in the 19th century. It's the same thing. It happens today as it does many other days. I'm going to show you a few pictures about things and talk about these in some simple way. This is um, a picture of Thompson's Hall. These are some pictures of Tuskegee University. Tuskegee, well, it's Tuskegee Institute when I grew up. Now it's Tuskegee University. These halls were built by hand. Every brick paint were built by the students at the school. Now, I know that it would be a challenge for you to build him some, but I know you could do it. Of course, it's taking a while. But here, you have to remember, there was no place to go out and buy anything when they were building this institution. They had their own veterinary medical school, they had their own agricultural program. They actually were a complete unit. They provided all of their food, they provided all of their electrical power, they provided even the buildings in which they built. That's pretty much the kind of character that I saw as I grew up. This is what you can do. There's no limitations whatsoever. This is Whitehall, and it really is not my family. So every once in a while I just put it up there and don't say anything. But uh, this is the economics uh, building. And another one of these hand-built sort of things. And just to give you a chance to know that as I was growing up, we had a lot of people, some of whom are quite luminaries now uh, in the entertainment industry. This was our science club. Our science club is a, was a great thing. I mean, I enjoyed it tremendously. Uh, that's me right there, just in case. <laughs> and that's somebody you might know. Lionel Richie. Yeah, that's Lionel Richie, the guy who has billions, and has billions of dollars. And Lionel and I had uh, very good uh, interactions because, number one, he was very interested in science. You have to understand, this is a community that generated a broad spectrum of individuals. Tom Jordan, by the way, is not in this picture, he's in the other picture, but he was also a member of the science, the science club. We understood something very, very clear in that community, and that was you had no limitations, and everybody expected you to be successful. And I'm not talking about getting all A's or getting selected for one thing or another. It was just basic stuff. You just did not fail, period. And if you thought you were, you had a whole town that would help you. So to end that part, Mr. Carver lived by a creed of how far you can go in life depends upon being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, 
sympathetic with the striving and tolerant of the weak and strong because someday in your life you will have been all of these. And he's absolutely right. I think I have one or two that I still have to, this age of business I'm still trying to deal with. <laughs> but just my last story about George Washington Carver. Remember I told you he didn't have a salary? Well, he never took one, ever. And they kept paying him and kept calling him up and saying, Dr. Carver, will you please cash your, your check? He said, what do I need money for? So I never started out with it. He never cashed a check. They just finally said, put it into a fund. And that fund was used to support students who didn't have money to go to Tuskegee. What do I mean? Anyway, my path started there. That's the background. That's where I grew up. Even in all of that turmoil, even in all of that effort to try to understand how we actually get to a point where you're independent, where you have academic structure, where you can actually look at people who are successful around you, even though you didn't recognize it as success, you just recognized that's what they did. As it was said in the introduction, I went to Earl College in Richmond, Indiana. And this was in the 1960s. A great deal of this had to do with the fact that the Civil Rights Acts were passed in 1964, and every college and university in the country was trying to, for want of a better term, diversify their student body. So I had lots of offers. And I enjoyed my time at that small Quaker school, only a thousand students. But it was academically very, very interesting. You have to remember there were a lot of people who thought the African American community needed doctors, needed lawyers, needed people in business, entertainment, uh, and I wanted to study physics. You can imagine the amount of attention I got. But I also enjoyed music and had the chance to direct the, what we call the, the student choir and orchestra. And we had this trip that we took every summer, now every winter, to various parts of the Midwest or to the East. And one of the places that we went at Colonel College, as student conductor, I had to conduct, uh, at Carnegie Hall, or Carnegie Recital Hall. I'll tell you this, Carnegie Recital Hall is upstairs, Carnegie Hall is downstairs. And usually when I give this story, I say, I conducted at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> and they'd say, well, no, that's not true. Then I'd bring out the program and show it. And uh, that was very great. I enjoyed my time there. I studied very hard. And then decided to go off to Michigan State University, where I studied uh, nuclear and accelerator physics. And this is where I published my first paper. I did not have a, a teaching assistantship or scholarship. I just went there, made an application to the college, to the university, and walked into the cyclotron lab and asked for a job. And the head of the cyclotron lab was from Virginia. And Henry said, well, you're a graduate student, right? He said, well, how did you get into the college? I said, I just applied. And of course, coming from Earlham College, they had no idea who this student was. So I had a chance to actually do some science. And the first paper I published, and I wish I had brought the distribution to it, was looking for multi-elemental uh, materials, heavy elements and multi-elemental materials, like tuna fish. You heard about this story of looking for uh, mercury and tuna fish? Well, we did that particular experiment at Michigan State, and I decided, well, we should be able to do this with any kind of material. So we used Coca-Cola, cow's milk, and wait for it, human blood. It was my blood. <laughs> so when I talk to my students now, and I give them, I said, this is my first paper, and I'm sure that you can outdo me, except one of these distributions is for looking for heavy elements of human blood, and that is my blood, and I got it published. They started publishing Frankenstein. <laughs> it wasn't great. In 1972, I was a Sloan Fellow at the CERN, Lib uh, CERN Laboratory in Switzerland. Uh, it was the first time that I had been in Europe. Uh, I lived in Communi, which is a small village north of Geneva, and not a soul in that village spoke English. When I did this particular presentation of the history makers at the school where I went to uh, high school in Tuskegee a few years ago, 
I mentioned to the students that you should study absolutely everything you can because you have no idea when it will be useful to you. Because sitting in that village and having to pay your bills and get food, you needed to understand at least how to learn a different language. And I told the students that I learned that language two doors down on the left. It was very impressive to many of the students there because many times you ask, why do I have to learn this stuff? I'm never going to use it. Not true. At Fermilab, big physics was what I really wanted to do. After CERN, I changed from nuclear and accelerator physics to particle physics. Such an interruption in my academic training because I went into a different field. And one of the motivations that I was given to go to Fermilab was the brand new laboratory. Uh, in fact, I went there in 1971, and it was just mud. It was a construction area. It would rain that day, and I said, what have done? Who would want to work here? And that's 39 years ago. And while there, I came up with some ideas that would help me in terms of my academic work and got an invitation from Yale University to study there uh, as a teaching fellow and university fellow for a few years, and then to finish experimental high energy physics at Florida State for my PhD. Now, I'm going to skip a little bit of this because I want to tell you essentially some of the things that happened to me in Fermi Laboratory that essentially made the history makers come look for me. This is on my laboratory in 1977. I joined the lab as a full-time employee in 1974. Many of the experiments were all what we call fixed target experiments. You accelerate the particle beams to very high energies, extract it, and look for various things. The way in which these work, and I'm sure you probably already know this, but every once in a while I like to have some kind of visual thing because I learned how to do this, I had to sort of use it. Um, goal, target, particle beam hits the target, produce these secondary particles, which we then build very large detectors and measure their properties. That's what particle physics is about. And also try to understand whether the theories that actually predict how they work are going to be um, correct. We increased our laboratory, built it to various things. And then I did a few experiments with the new superconducting experiment known as the Tevatron in neutrino physics. One of the big problems in neutrino physics had to do with trying to understand how many neutrinos you could produce. And being a young and somewhat brash person, I told my supervisors, well, you know, why don't we just measure everything? And of course, they laughed. Very nice. Prior to the work that we proposed, the ability to just determine how many neutrinos that you have in a system, you were good to maybe 50%. And then one night, we took a battleship and decommissioned the steel and put it into our neutrino beam to absorb all the charged particles. 40,000 tons, actually. Still there. And we measured everything associated with that particular interaction. And we came up with a formula that parameterized what's known as the neutrino flux. And that's what this formula is. It's called Stefanski and White. Um, I have a lot of stories I can tell you about that. But this particular formula actually produced the correct prediction for neutrinos to within 1%. And that had never been done ever before. 22 years later, someone came up to me and said, you do realize, of course, that you're the first African American in history to have an equation that bears his name. And I said, come on, give me a break. That's not true. It's not even that much of an equation. Well, it turns out that it was true. And I was very happy about that. My mother thought about it. She was very proud. Um, I said, well, it's not even MC squared or anything like that. <laughs> It worked. And I put this up here basically because in the effort to do my work, we had to solve a problem. And the motivation was not to produce an equation that bears your name. The motivation was to try to understand why you could not predict the flux of neutrinos 
when you had everything there. Well, at high energies, you could collect it. And that was the first time you could collect it because we had the highest energy machine in the world. And it just made sense. I'm fairly proud of that now, but you know, everyone says, okay, what have you done lately? Uh, we need another formula, Dr. White. <laughs> so we started to do an experiment known as KTEF. This was many years later. Um, I had completed my PhD by this time. The K the, what you're seeing now is a movie of putting together this $30 million experiment to measure the, the complex of the decay of a very, very strange part. The understanding of the symmetry associated with that decay was identified and discovered in 1962, but had not been highly measured and precisely measured until this experiment. My task as part of this work was to put this detector together in six months and make it work. Now, of course, I was told by many that that was impossible. I had to give my presentations to the energy department, and all the people who were reviewing us said, that's impossible. My response was, that's what we do, the impossible. We did put it together in six months. And here you're seeing actually a time-lapse uh, picture of that assembly. We took one photograph, eight o'clock every morning for six months. We did put it together, it worked, on the very first pulse, we actually reconstructed the particle we were looking for, and everyone said, what a tremendous achievement. That's what the final detector looked like. And as a result of that, we learned a great deal about matter and antimatter in the universe. And I, would go, I could go through that when you invite me back to give a technical talk. <coughs> because when matter and antimatter meet, you get annihilation, and there's there's a real formula. For this work, I received the Edward A. Boucher Award from the American Physical Society, which has been given out to one person for the past number of years. And I was very, very happy about that. Edward A. Boucher, by the way, was the first African American to get a PhD degree in any subject. Happens to be physics, happened to have been in Yale. So we had a little bit of a connection, and I was very happy to be able to have that. My other two colleagues, this is uh, myself, Professor Larry Gladney, who's chairman of the physics department at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, Sylvester Jim Gates at the University of Maryland, and we've been giving a presentation around the country about the complete expanse of the universe, from the very smallest to the very largest. And I just put that picture in because I wanted to end this talk by telling you essentially how my life has come from the time we were studying in high school and people shooting in our houses to teaching in Africa at the International oh, at the African School on, on Science in Ghana. And I have to also just for levity in this program by saying that we have this little reception and the people who are, uh, uh, we got Sulu's, uh, oh. I forgot the tribe, but there was a woman at this particular party who went around and stroked people's, uh, painted their faces. And this is a sign of uh, a great deal of, of uh, achievement and Welcome. When she saw me, because I was the only guy that had a tie on, she thought I should lighten up a little bit. And so you can't know what she's doing. And she just sort of put little stripes there, and then she put this sunbeam right in the middle of my head. And all of the lights started to flash with people taking photographs. So I thought you would probably think that was kind of interesting. So, Albert Einstein also is a history maker. And this is a photograph that was, um, I received from the Leo, Leo Beck Institute. Uh, he was making a presentation at Lincoln University in 1946. 
He's also a man of real concern about civil rights and the support of civil rights. So this presentation has been a little bit about history, and you might ask, how did you get to be a scientist with that amount of history? And I hope you, you've got a little, just a little snapshot of where my life has been, because I think the I have committed is pretty much what we actually did when I started to go to school. When we think about history and think about the contributions of many people in our society, independent of their cultural, academic backgrounds. As far as science is concerned, at least for me, nature doesn't care what your opinion is. It doesn't care whether you are a slave or not. It doesn't care whether you are wealthy or not. Nature is nature. And the more you learn, the more you will actually be able to contribute back to our society and straighten this mess out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. White. Are there any questions for Dr. White? I know you talked a bit about how, you know, those specific civil rights events really brought together the community in that area. Uh, I'm curious on how it, like, personally, I don't know, affected you emotionally, just, like, going through that time period. I know you said that one of uh, your classmates' brothers was, like, murdered. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, Simon Young Jr. Was, was killed for trying to use a bathroom. Uh, I guess you could say that, you know, we grew up in a system that was... Well, segregation is one thing, uh, because that's systematic, that's, that's systemic. Uh, but we actually interacted with, with, uh, with white children. Uh, as I said, you know, in that, that picture I showed you, the, the reason that our street was not completely gerrymandered is because if they did that, they would cut the mayor of the city out, because they lived right behind us. Out. It, it seems strange in terms of segregation these days, but the way in which the streets just happen to build up, that's the way it happened. But going to school and being in charge of things was very different. Emotionally, I didn't have much of an emotion about it. Uh, most of the community of Tuskegee were African Americans. Uh, so we did have interactions with people who were merchants. Uh, they were usually uh, Caucasian people. Um, and there was always a, a certain amount of understanding within that community about what was or what was not acceptable. Uh, people started to get killed because of the fact that things had to change. And it really had to do with the power of the vote. In that community, we wouldn't have had Lucius Amerson as a, as a, uh, as a sheriff. We wouldn't have had people in leadership roles, and they would be clearly capable of doing leadership roles, except for segregation and the, the power of segregation in that, that part of the country. I basically was fairly focused on a lot of the things that I wanted to do. Uh, I had a dog, and we would go out exploring in the country, and uh, my parents came from the rural part of Alabama, so during the summers we would go there and stay and learn about you know the cows and hogs and that sort of thing but we lived in the city. Um, civil rights was something that basically was very active within the entire country during that time. It was not, for a young person who was you know, 12 years old, we listened to our parents because it wasn't so much the activity, it was the protection. You have to understand, it was not like a siege or anything of that sort, but there were people who were being killed, literally, all over the place. And there was no, basically there was no uh, protection, except your own protection. And there was no justice in a lot of those cases. You read, you've read about them, you know, Edwards and all these, I mean, everything that had to happen in that particular area had, apparently had to happen the way it did. I was not emotionally connected with it at all. I was very happy to be able to do my crazy experiments in my mother's kitchen, uh, go hunting, engage in sports. And we had a whole 
very, very exceptional community. We have people who were, uh, Mr. Anderson, who was still there. This is the man who took Eleanor Roosevelt up uh, as part of the Tuskegee Airmen's effort to be able to actually go fight in the war. Uh, and he lived down the street. I mean, there, he was textbook name his history and historical people within your reach that you saw at church every Sunday. You didn't think about it. They were just people that you knew. So I didn't have that kind of emotional connection with the exception of people who were already passed on, like George Washington Carver, who you watched it. That was the history that we had. And that's what we actually understood. My sister was different. She was very tough. Other questions? Yes. Was it hard being an African American and wanting to become a scientist? Like, did were were there ever people who told you you can't be mad because you're black or stuff like that going on? Um, I. If you didn't hear that question, you wanted to know if the, being an African American scientist had I did I have a lot of discouragement? Well, yes, uh, from just about everybody, uh, because being a physicist was kind of unusual. Uh, when we actually had what was called the uh, National Society of Black Physicists and hosted that organization in 1977 or 78. And we were able to essentially, in one room, have every African-American who had a PhD in physics in the world in 1977. And it was less than the people who we had in this room. I was not um, encouraged because people sort of felt that you could have a better life if you were a medical doctor. Because that was not just accepted, but it was part of the kind of polarization that we have in our society today. If you're an independent-minded person and you're a little bit stubborn, just a little bit, um, I was not going to actually defer from what I wanted to do, period. And it didn't matter, in fact, whether I got good grades, it didn't matter whether I um, went to the universities I wanted to go to, I knew what I was going to do. Um, there, there were people who did encourage me, and uh, one of them founded this place. And Leon Letterman and I, um, when he first became director of Fermilab in 1979, I had a very two or three interesting experiences with, with Leon. And he was very, very, he still is very thoughtful with regard to some things that are outside of science. And one of the things was that don't complain to a director. You usually get a new job. We brought African Americans and underrepresented people to our laboratory starting in 1971. We've been doing that every summer for that many years. And even though there are numbers of students at our laboratory, there were a few people that I was frustrated with because I said, we have students who are coming in and they leave without knowing what a proton is. They come, they pull cables, they help someone else do an experiment, and no one ever explains why they're there. Not just the African American students, but all the students. So I complained to Leon about that. He listened very carefully, had a little brown book, wrote notes in it, and I thought I was you know, very, I'm talking to the director, and get him to do something. Well, a week later, he called me to his office and said, I think you're right, and so you should come up with a solution to that problem and report to me within the week. <laughs> and I stopped asking directors <laughs> for advice. But Leon was very, very helpful to me in my career um, doing the k experiment was basically his idea. I was going to do colliding beams experiments because that was part of what my dissertation was on. And he said, they need you over here. I said, come on, no, they need you. I said, all right, fine, I'll learn something about antimatter or some foolishness like that. Well, it turns out that that was the best experiment I have ever done. And 
Every once in a while, you have people. The Stefanski of Stefanski and White was a man who um, accepted the fact that I did not know a whole lot of things when I was working on that particular form. I was just fresh out of school. But I felt everybody was equally ignorant because what we did, everyone, were things that had not been done before by anyone. And that's a freedom that you rarely get. Here's an idea, and it could be right. Uh, Mr. Peter Higgs in London, or Scotland, came up with the idea of a Higgs particle in the 60s. I personally believe he'll get the Nobel Prize next month. But it was discovered last year, 2012. Think about that. You have an idea, you have to stick with it, you have to commit, and it may take decades, literally, for you to see, in fact, if you've done something correct. Now, I say this only with regard to doing absolutely new things. And there are things that are absolutely new, have never been done before, never seen before. No one really knows how to, what problems are going to come up. That's exploration. That is what I call pioneering. And I was very free to do that in my career. And people who allow you to do that are the ones that help you. If they say, you must do this, and of course I grew up in a system to say, you can't do this, that's very different than, I don't want you to do this. But to say that you're not academically and intellectually capable of doing certain things. I have people who write me notes now and say, by the way, I used your formula. Thank you. And these were not people who supported me. But they understood their idea of success was that even under those circumstances, you made a contribution to your field that everybody uses. And that fact, that's my security. I mean, to answer your question more directly, I let my work speak for me. I know how the world exists today. There's still polarization in our, in our, in our, in our world and in our, in our country in particular, out of which side of the political spectrum you're on or, or which side of the class spectrum you're on. But in the field that I'm in, I let my work speak for me. And I've had many people who I really don't get on very well. But usually when we have a <clears throat> heated discussion, I'll say, if you really don't like me, that's fine. But don't use my work, and I guarantee you yours will fail. And they know that. And then we laugh and go, yeah. You know, everyone does not rationalize the same way. I know what some people will say in terms of the, the choices that I've made in going into high energy particle physics and going into this particular area of physics, which is really hard in a lot of ways. And you have to make the case that it actually will have some value 50 years from now and still get the general public to support your work. Now, that's really hard. And there's a lot of discouragement in terms of doing that. But as an African-American, if, if anyone discouraged me from doing the work that I wanted to do, I literally ignored them. I figured that if they weren't going to support me, then it's best that they do something else. Other questions? Yes? When you were in high school, you said that you were really interested in science and figuring out how things worked. But what I want to know is, what made you want to choose physics to major, especially knowing that it was so discouraged to African Americans? Well, actually, I started out uh, when I went to undergraduate school in nuclear engineering. That was what I was really interested in because I saw a number of things happening with regard to, you know, the the discovery of how to split an atom. It had just been a few years before that, and you know, atomic weapons and all that sort of thing. I was very, very excited about that being the future. You know. Uh, if you look back at some of the old um, popular science, they talk about having a nuclear reactor in the trunk of your car and having a nuclear reactor at the bottom of your refrigerator and, you know, energy was just going to be perfect. And I thought, yeah, this is what I should be doing. This would be a lot of fun. It's just like blowing up my mother's kitchen. But once I started in a program at Earlham College where you go to school for three years 
and study physics or some area of science, and then you go two years at another institution, because we didn't have engineering, then you would have two degrees at the end of that. So I had finished all of my academic requirement to be able, at the undergraduate level, to be able to go on to, I think it was Rensselaer, uh, to study uh, engineering. And it dawned upon me that I had finished all my undergraduate requirements. And it would still be two years before I had any degree whatsoever. And logic being what it is, I said, well, maybe I should just get this physics degree and then I'll do the engineering afterwards. And that last year of studying and seminars and reading and getting a chance to do my undergraduate thesis, which was on looking for, uh, you know, during the time that we tested atomic bombs, uh, there was a lot of radiation that went into the environment. And so my undergraduate thesis was essentially to go around and get these cans of dirt from various parts of the area and the country and use a, a procedure to measure what the uh, radiation background was in them. And so sort of map out essentially where that radiation had landed after we had, do, <coughs> after we had done above ground testing. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, the real motivation there was to use the college's new computer because we didn't have a computer before that. And when I was going to college, I worked in Detroit with the Chrysler Corporation uh, as a subassembler of the Chrysler 300 steering gear. It's, if you want to really, really be motivated to get your PhD, do that. <laughs> and then the next year, I sold encyclopedias door to door and had lots of free time, so I took a class in computer science. And when I went back, there were three people on that campus who knew how to program a computer. So I programmed my undergraduate thesis to do this calculations very fast. And then dawned upon me, I could do physics. So this is what you do as a physicist. And it was very different than engineering, because engineering, you have to build things and it has to work and that sort of thing. But physics, you ask a question, propose a, a process for answering that question, and then you go and answer it. And I got hooked. So I said, oh, okay, no more nuclear engineering, I'll go work on cyclotrons. And so I went off to Michigan State to study physics and cyclotrons. And look at my own blood. <laughs> All right, one more question for Dr. White. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, do you happen to remember what experiment you performed when you had suffered on this kitchen? Yes. <laughs> you, you really want me to share that with your students here? Well, no, this is them, so that's right. They're going to do it anyway. Um, I, um, I was fascinated by, you know, combustion. Fire. But basically, I, I did some experiments with uh, vinegar and baking soda in a confined space. You want the details? <laughs> I, I got the measurement. I, I finally got the measurement correct so that you could you know, knock the projectile out. You can buy it at Spencer Gifts now. But in those days, this was a, this was a great thing. And there was plenty of, my mother's a great cook. And so there was plenty of vinegar, plenty of baking soda, and so I just started mixing these things up. I was more into chemistry at that time. And there was one unusual day. My mother was in nursing, and she was a pediatric nurse, and so I would have the house sort of free. <laughs> and I put these things together, and that particular day was very dramatic. <laughs> but she was a, you know, she, she's, my mother's 89 years old, and, and she still remembers that. And uh, she was very kind to me because she said, well, I think you're going to learn how to cook, and you're going to learn how to clean. <laughs> so I spent the rest of that day cleaning the kitchen, and uh, my kitchen was very clean now. <laughs> it's a good skill to have, you know, you know, you don't have to blow the kitchen up before you do that. That, that, was the, that was one of the experiments I did inside. The others were outside, and I, I can't talk about it. <laughs> but I appreciate uh, you coming and hearing my, my, uh, my words of, about my life and about 
what happened to get me to where I am today uh, and the impacts of many things that happened in the history of our country. Um, and I am very, very privileged to actually be back in Insta to talk to you again. And I thank you very much.